Hello, forensic scientists. We are going to talk about alcohol today in this uh, presentation. And then we, uh, we're we also going to have uh, an activity on blood alcohol content that we're going to do after this. Um, so alcohol is a drug. It's the most abused drug in America, which is very obvious if you go into most grocery stores around here, or you look at how many liquor stores there are. Um, about 40% of all traffic deaths are alcohol related. That means that if there's an, uh, an accident, a traffic accident that involves death and they test the people for alcohol, that there is alcohol present. Um, whether or not you could say that alcohol caused that accident would be something that you need to turn back time to know. Um, it is a toxin that affects the central nervous system. If you guys look at your mouse, uh, your mouse party where they all, all the stone mice, um, you can see what the depressant does and how it actually works on two different neurotransmitters um, to give its effect. Alcohol appears in the, in the blood within minutes. So after you have it, not you, but after somebody has a drink, then it's going to, um, it only takes minutes to get into your blood. So there's not a lot of time where it's just hanging out waiting to be absorbed. And also for every ounce of alcohol, it takes one hour for it to be fully broken down. Um, so this means that your liver processes the alcohol and it is no longer toxic to your brain. Um, so what something that's uh, kind of interesting here is if you look, you can see people, normal 43 year olds, so somebody that does not abuse alcohol and um, alcoholic 43 year old, you can see that the brain, they would call these lesions here. Um, and the bright blue is brain activity. The darker areas are supposed not brain activity. Um, so you can see how it has long-term effects on the central nervous system here. Um, immediate effects, if you guys haven't seen it because it's the most abused drug in America, um, we have blurry vision, difficulty walking, slurred speech, slowed reaction times, and impaired memory. All of these effects are basically uh, showing that your brain is not working as well as it should. It doesn't have the feedback loops and response time it should. Um, so alcohol is absorbed through your stomach and small intestines. Those are the first two things that anything you eat or drink hits. Um, and it's uh, broken down in, in the liver. And so you can see here, if you guys have ever heard about cirrhosis, that's because the liver is processing too much alcohol. It's working too hard. It gets becomes fatty. Um, or there's fatty liver disease, which is like a pre-cirrhosis, and then uh, cirrhosis happens later. Alcohol is not the only thing that can cause cirrhosis in your liver. It can also be caused by genetic disorders or from really poor diet, um, but it's the number one cause of cirrhosis. So um, that's something to keep in mind there. It's not the only thing that causes your liver to work too hard. Um, if you take a lot of prescription drugs, you can also get, um, you can also damage your liver because that's where the prescriptions are processed. Um, or the drugs are processed. Um, so since alcohol can pass through cells in your body, that's how it's absorbed so quickly. Uh, it can also be pumped. It can also be excreted through your lungs a little bit. And so this is where you guys think about breathalyzer tests. Um, it's because when the alcohol in your blood passes around in your lungs, just like how there's CO2 that you're exhaling and O2 that you're breathing in with that CO2, some alcohol is also going to escape. Um, it's not really enough to be, you know, considered how you get rid of rid of alcohol or how it's processed in your body, though. Um, so what we're going to look at here is we're going to look at blood alcohol content. You guys might have heard about this. Um, if you've taken driver's ed, they talk about uh, legal limits of driving. But what they've done is they've uh, scientists and forensic scientists and toxicologists have done a really good job of correlating or linking what your blood alcohol content is and how that inhibits your um, how that inhibits your function. So like, you know, slurred speech or blurred, or you can't see blurred vision in somebody else, but, um, you know, uh, balance and things like that. We're going to go over that in a minute too. Um, and so what we're looking at is the amount of alcohol consumed. So like how strong was the drink, um, or how many drinks, how strong was the drink? Um, how long did it take you to consume it? So, you know, the guy pounding shots at the bar is gonna get really, really drunk really, really quick. You can have the same amount of drinks over, you know, two weeks and you weren't gonna get drunk at all. Um, your gender is actually a big deal. They've been able to correlate that. Um, if you have any food in your stomach, because alcohol can kind of hide out in your food for a little bit. Um, so if you have alcohol with a big meal, 
um, you won't get a sharp rise. You won't get a sharp rise in your BAC like this. It's going to be more like this. Um, funny enough, this is flattening the curve. The food in your stomach flattens the curve of your alcohol absorption. Uh, just to link it to coronavirus, I guess. Um, and then also the physiology. So if you have something else going on in your body, then you might not fit the standard idea of where your blood alcohol content is from your drinks. You can check out this chart over here for the differences in men and women. Um, and then here is a more, um, a more precise chart. And it's kind of interesting here how your body weight can be is has such a big impact and that's because you have more mass for that alcohol to be diluted into so you know a 100 pound person is going to have less blood than a 240 pound first person and this 240 pound person can drink more because the alcohol won't be as high of a percentage in their blood uh, same amount of alcohol lower percentage um, we can also see possibly impaired so maybe feeling effects maybe not definitely feeling effects but not huge amount and then legally intoxicated that's going to be our 0.08 threshold there um, so there's two ways that this is done by law enforcement agencies and um, that's going to be measuring the alcohol present in your blood or the alcohol content measured in your breath um, this is when they test how much is in your breath that's just testing how much is in your breath not how much is in your body um if you are ever unfortunate enough to be in a situation where you are um being tested for alcohol and you know when you're on the road which you should never be um a big thing is that you can always request to have your blood tested for alcohol um and then you can have they'll they always take two samples of your blood and then you can have your blood processed by an independent um but independent labs. You don't need to rely on the police findings for your blood alcohol. Um, in other states, not in Illinois, and I am not a lawyer, uh, but I did just, uh, I read up on this a little bit. There's no difference between driving while intoxicated and driving under the influence. If you um, are in another state and you get pulled over and you're in a situation where you are looking at a DWI versus a DUI, just realize um, that if you except either charge in another state, Illinois treats them the same, you're gonna lose your license for a year. Um, when we are looking at uh, people being under the influence of alcohol, um, what we are looking at is 0.08% of your blood is has some alcohol content in it. Um, and we can see with our driving impairment, a nice little visual over here. For everybody in this class, any detectable amount, is going to be a huge deal. For me and Mr. Held, we're looking at 0.08. Um, I personally find that if I'm drinking at all, I just don't drive um, because I, I feel that since I don't have a breathalyzer in my car, I never know when I'm at 0.08. And I really don't want to go down that road. So I just alter my lifestyle um, or... Um, you know, don't drink if I know that I'm going to be driving, especially with my two little kids. Um, because once again, I do not have a breathalyzer in my car. I've never been breathalyzed. I have no idea what 0.08% uh, BAC feels like to an exact T. I can only go off charts like this or charts like this, which are a good indicator, but that's not specific to my physiology. And do what I really want to game or would I really want to risk my license between two and three drinks here? I don't think so. Um, another thing is that if you are asked to take a breathalyzer, so if you are asked to prove your sobriety, you are not innocent until proven guilty. You are kind of legally required to give a breathalyzer. Um, you can always ask to go to the uh, station and have your blood alcohol be drawn uh, by a nurse, but um, you are going to lose your license if you say you don't want to be tested. Um, there are some cool things here on how they can actually gauge sobriety, um, and this is going to be more accurate than in handheld uh, breathalyzer. And we have horizontal gaze nystagmus, which is something really interesting we'll talk about in a second. We have walk and turn, which is um, another way. And then we have the one leg stand, which we're gonna go over here. So horizontal gaze nystagmus is uh, when your eyes 
when you focus on something and it moves from side to side, your eyes track that. And there's like a little lag time. So your eyes actually, when they move, they go, duh, 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 duh. Um, when you have been drinking, that becomes really pronounced. If you guys want to see some, if you want to see this kind of, um, if you want to see this without being drunk, how your eyes can have a nice diagnosis, you can spin around in one of those rolly chairs um, or have somebody else do it. It's a lot easier to see in somebody else. And then you watch their eyes and you'll see their eyes continue to track around the room. And that's them being dizzy. Um, I used to do, my kids had it. Um, it was really fun to do when they were little. Um, so we have walking and turning or a one leg stand. Um, and you basically walk down a straight line, turn around and walk back. Um, or you hold your foot up and count. Um, so there's other laws that are linked to drinking, um, having an open container in a law. So like if, you know, somebody's in your car and they are drinking, um, this is also illegal. Um, and it can be when it's parked or being driven. So, you know, if you're hanging out in your car or not you, but a person is hanging out in their car and they're drinking, that is an open container violation. Um, and then of course, None of you guys can possess any alcohol, which is why I wanted to uh, say not you guys, because no matter what you're doing, if you have a drink, that's illegal. Um, so for forensics testing, what they're really looking for is to identify the presence of alcohol. So um, you can see if the BAC is over the legal limit, um, if a minor has been drinking, um, if somebody on parole has stopped drinking, because a lot of time parole people released on parole will have a stipulation that they have to stay sober. Um, and then once again, like we were talking about before, if alcohol con consumption has contributed to an accident. Um, we also have post-mortem testing. So like as you guys saw in Poisoner's Handbook, they did um, testing of the illuminating gas in the blood. And you can also check the uh, deceased person's blood to see um, if they were under the influence of alcohol. Um, and here is a really interesting way that uh, you can try to beat the breathalyzer. But really, if you're on, if you are, if you are in a situation where you're taking a breathalyzer and it doesn't read 0.0, .0 um, it's a good idea that to get that followed up with a blood test also, just so you can get independent testing on that. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this, and um, good luck, forensic scientists.